This is a production of Cornell University. So thank you, thank you, Sandy. I couldn't have uh, presented my work better than Sandy did. Really, I need to write it so I know how to describe it in the future. Uh, and it's very uh, special for me to, to be here and have Sandy uh, also introducing me. It's been six years since I left. It's really nice to come visit here. I've been telling to people that when you live here, you forget a little how, how pretty it is here, how beautiful, because you get used to it too much. But um, when you come visit here, you suddenly see it. Wow, it's so, uh, it's so pretty. And also, it's, I think, the first time I'm giving a talk um, uh, in front of real people in many, many years. So I need to, I'm a little nervous. So it's been really like going back in time. But just the gray hair, unfortunately, doesn't go back. Uh, <laughs> um, so <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so I left here in 2016, uh, and I moved to uh, okay to Lake Alfred uh, in Florida. This is a, a research station of the University of Florida that focuses on citrus research. And also, it was a big change moving from Arabidopsis. I don't know if you can see it, this little thing here into studying uh, citrus trees. Uh, there was in one very in one zoom meeting when i was spacing out and i was bored i calculated that just on the top part you can fit in 1500 arapidopsis uh, <laughs> plants so it's been a very big uh, different kind of research so everything was very different also and also working with the trees it's a different level of complexity it's extremely slow but it's been good. It's been very, very good. It's been, I was just telling Gary, we talked about, it's nice to step out of your comfort zone sometimes. And also the re reality has many more sunny days than the bubble. <laughs> so that was also a very uh, nice thing. I hope you can hear So in my lab, like Sandy said, we are, we, uh, we focus on, pathogens that are phloem localized in citrus. And we have two favorite pathogens. One is the citrus tristasia virus, and the other is the Candidatus liberibacter asiaticus, which is a bacteria. And for both of them, we are looking at the plant host and also the insect host. And we're trying to study uh, the interaction uh, between the pathogen and the host. But today I'll just focus on one part on the phloem association between Candidatus liberibacter asiaticus and the citrus. So Candidatus liberibacter asiaticus, which I will call Silas from now on, is the causal agent of citrus greening or citrus huanglong bean, which I will call Agil B. So Silas is the pathogen, it's the bacteria, and Agil B is the disease. I'm sure you heard a lot about this disease from Michelle. Um, uh, it is a, a very, very devastating disease uh, in Florida, and I'll show you just how much. So this is from a very recent uh, um, news article that shows the production of oranges. So Florida used to produce between 200 to 250 million boxes per year, and today it's less than uh, 50. So the industry really uh, went down by about 85 so it's a huge, huge blow to the citrus industry in Florida and grapefruit is the same thing. And just a few numbers in the last five years, each year, uh, Florida is losing a billion, $1 billion. Each year, 5,000 people lose their jobs. So if you think about these 10, 15 years that the disease went on, it's a huge, num huge number of people that lost their jobs in this industry. The number of growers really shrunk and there is no cures to the disease. So the pathogen uh, Silas is a gram negative bacteria. It's intracellular. So unlike most of the bacteria that 
we are studying it's uh, inside another cell and it's not culturable, which makes sense because it needs to be in a host cell. And also it's flow limited, which is also making studying this disease more complicated because the flow is a very narrow tissue inside the tree and it's very hard to get to this tissue, very hard to isolate this tissue. So this uh, is definitely not an easy disease uh, to study. And unfortunately, we know very little about the mechanism of the disease, what, what is causing what and how the disease is progressing. And what we do know is that after the tree will get infected by the, um, by the bacteria and the bacteria is transmitted by an insect, by a psyllid, um, slowly, slowly, you will see a decline uh, in the tree, uh, the trees, uh, the roots are dying, uh, the canopy starts to die, and it's a slow process that takes a few years until uh, eventually the tree uh, will die. But throughout this whole process, it will not produce uh, uh, the regular yield that the growers need to get. In terms of what we see that is happening in the tree after the bacteria enters, we see that there is plugging of the phloem. Uh, there is accumulation of callos inside the phloem. There is induction of the defense response of the tree. There is hormones imbalance in the tree and there is an induction of the uh, reactive oxygen uh, species. So the way I organize this talk and I'll present our work. Um, I did it in a way that we're going from the field, uh, going down to the physiology, to the cellular, and then some molecular level studies. And um, all of this work was important for us to understand more and more about how the uh, disease progresses and what's the mechanism of the disease. So I'll start with the uh, field uh, work. And this work we did in collaboration with another lab. Uh, with Tripti Vashist. And here, what we um, wanted to understand, this was really a very applied project. It was very much like growers in mind to help the growers. And what we wanted to see is which parameters are important for the disease. So from the grower perspective, uh, severe disease is when you don't have a lot of fruit. And a mild disease is when you have a lot of fruit, but to measure every time the yield, the fruit yield is very, very difficult and almost impossible. So we were looking for something else that we can see in the tree that can tell the growers this tree is very sick or this tree is less sick. Because it's just like with COVID, you know, we can all get the pathogen, but some of us will be very severely ill, but others will not feel anything. And this is also true for the trees. They're not reacting in the same way. Um, so if we go with this kind of human disease thing, what we were looking at is to find something like when we measure the temperature, that we can give the grower something easy to measure the temperature of the tree, and that will tell him this tree is very sick or this tree is not very sick. So it was a long project with a lot of uh, factors, and I won't go uh, over everything. Uh, what we wanted to see is what is uh, what uh, correlates with the yield eventually. And we found three uh, factors that are correlated with the yield. So the first one was the canopy volume. So um, if you have more canopy, you're going to produce uh, more fruits, you're, you're healthier. The light interception, uh, which is how much light is uh, intercepted, absorbed by uh, the tree. So if you have uh, more light absorbed, it means your canopy, canopy is, is denser and you will produce more fruit. And the last one that was correlated was the fruit detachment force. So um, how strong the fruit is connected to the tree. If it's, if it's harder to pull off, it's if, if it's connected stronger, then the tree gives more yield. Uh, the tree is healthier. But maybe the most uh, interesting thing for the rest of the talk is that we, when we looked at the city values and the bacterial population, we didn't see any uh, correlation with the yield. 
So it didn't matter if the bacteria was higher or lower, it didn't affect how much yield the tree is going to give. And I'm showing here in, uh, it, this is another example. So this is uh, three field trials that we did with different sweet orange varieties, different ages. And we um, divided the trees according to this light interception. So if there is less than 90% interception or if more than 10% of the light can go through, that means that the canopy is not very dense. You have those little holes in the canopy and we call these ones a severe tree. But if the canopy takes more than 90% of the light, we call this just mild. So the canopy is denser. And when we took all these trees in these different trials and we separated them, we saw that this works really well. And this is something that we really are now trying to push for growers because you're just, all you need to do is measure the light on top of the canopy and then below, you can see how much light is absorbed. And it really divided very nicely uh, the trees according to the yield. So in all the examples, uh, the mild ones, which absorbed more, more light had uh, about double the yield compared to the one that absorbed less light. But again, here, when we looked at the uh, city values and the bacterial population, there was just no difference that we can see between the ones that produce twice the yield or half the yield. In this first example, even there's twice the amount of bacteria and you get more yield. So that really was uh, the most, maybe the most interesting for us in this uh, study. And so we were asking, maybe it's not directly the pathogen that is causing the disease. And maybe it's more about the plant response that is involved in the disease progression. Okay, so the next uh, thing that we did, we were thinking what, what can be uh, something that can cause the disease that's related to the plant response. And like I told you before, um, one thing that was known that there is accumulation of callos in the phloem of these trees. And so we did some, uh, another project when we wanted to see if maybe the accumulation of callos is related to plugging the phloem and decreasing the sugar transport in those trees. So callos uh, is a, helical polymer of beta-1,3 glucan. And the idea with callos is that it forms this sugar that's very soft, it's like gelatous. Um, when you have beta-1,4 connection, you'll get cellulose. Cellulose is very, very stiff. It's almost impossible to break cellulose. People were trying a lot with all these biofuels uh, things, but it's very, very difficult. Um, but the beta-1,3, beta-1,3 connections are much easier to break. And the plant is using the cellulose when it needs something to be uh, stable and forever, but we'll choose always callos if something needs to be uh, temporary, where you can deposit and then break it later. So it's not surprising that when it comes to uh, blocking uh, the flowing pores or the plasmodesmata, one of the most important mechanisms is this deposition of callos. So in the phloem, um, just a quick reminder, phloem is built from the sieve tube elements and the sieve tube elements uh, are almost dead. There's very little inside which allows the flow, but what is really limiting the flow of the molecules like um, sugars and hormones and nutrients is the sieve plate with the sieve pores. And also the uh, sieve tube elements are connected to companion cells between with plasmodesmata, with regular plasmodesmata. And both the plasmodesmata here and the sieve pores are regulated by callos deposition. So callos, when it's deposited, it blocks the connection and limits the movement. So you can see this is a very simple diagram of the plasmodesmata. In, without callos, you will have an open pore and things like um, uh, like the sugars or sometimes viruses and other pathogens will be able to move from one cell to the other. But when you have callos deposited, it will block the pore and will stop the movement. 
Uh, and another thing that's important is that when you look at these disease symptoms, HLB symptoms, you see a lot of things that sort of suggest that there's a problem with the sugar transport because the leaves, they develop this uh, green, um, greenish um, uh, uh, symptom that we call blotchy motel. But when you stain and you, you, you see that they also accumulate a, a lot of starch, which always tells you that there's a problem with the transport. Also, the fruits are uh, bitter, they're asymmetrical, and they are green. So there's a lot of signs that maybe something is wrong with the sugar translocation. Also, when you are uh, taking a healthy plant and you are taking off the phloem, if you just griddle the phloem out, the symptoms that you're getting are similar to what you have with a sick HLB tree. So we sort of like put everything together and we um, were asking maybe this callous accumulation uh, uh, is uh, slowing down the sugar transport and uh, maybe this is one mechanism of this disease. So we developed, uh, we wanted to do something with big data and we uh, developed this method to, um, to get to the phloem and stain with aniline blue. And then we developed uh, this macro, this little program that gets rid of a lot of the background, like you can see on the side of the picture here, and just um, identifies the colors flags. And then the program just automatically do all the measurements and we can really have a big amount of data. I'll just mention now because it's good to talk about AI. I don't know how it is in Cornell, but in Florida, they're going completely nuts about it. Um, that we started to use AI uh, um, to, to identify those colors flags, and it really is better. I mean, it is a much better way to do things. We get a much higher uh, sensitivity uh, with those uh, uh, techniques, and we are now uh, uh, detecting, I think, a lot of these colors plugs. So we have a very good uh, level of data. So when we look at the phloem in a healthy tree and then in age will be infected tree, you can see these confocal images here. There's no, it's not hard to see that it gets completely uh, plugged and there's a huge difference. So the plant is responding very strongly uh, and uh, there is a lot of callus that is uh, accumulated inside uh, the phloem. So now the other part is the sugar translocation. So here we use this nice uh, setup. So we, we closed uh, one leaf inside this uh, sealed box. And then we used a, a radio labeled C14. So if we inject into this box the radioactive uh, bicarbonate, where uh, the carbon is labeled with citric acid, we will get inside this box now uh, the CO2 gas. And now this gas, the CO2 will be absorbed by the leaf and uh, the plant will make the sugars and they will start to be transported uh, inside the phloem. But the nice thing is that they're now uh, radio labeled. So if we put a detector we can see exactly when they reach to this point. And with another detector, we can see how, when they reach this point. And if we know the distance between those points, we can measure the speed of the sugar transport inside the tree. And the beauty of this uh, system is that it's completely non-invasive. And that's really very important when you're working with phloem. Everything you do changes things, but here we're not, we're not touching anything, basically. We're not doing anything that uh, damages the plant or change the plant. So we did this kind of big experiment. We looked at different, a lot of sites and a lot of um, measurements, but in general, uh, we were looking at the translocation speed, at the callos and uh, on the uh, city value and the bacteria number uh, in those trees. So this is the uh, callus accumulation. So we did this experiment on two different rootstocks. It's sweet orange on two different rootstocks. One is Cleopatra and the other X639. There was accumulation of callus in both, but it was much higher in the X639. When we looked at the translocation speed, we didn't see 
a difference when uh, in the Cleopatra, but in the X639 with this big colors change, there was a strong reduction in the translocation speed. Also, we looked at the export uh, of the sugars from the leaf, and also it was there was no difference in uh, the Cleopatra, but a big difference in the X639. Uh, uh, so we see here that the rootstock had uh, also an effect on this translocation speed, which is interesting. Another thing that the speeds that we were seeing are very, very slow, um, and it's uh, more typical for the, for the gymnosperms. So citrus might be this kind of special case where uh, it's not a gymnosperm, but it is an evergreen. So maybe uh, evergreens are, for some reason that we don't know, they don't want a, a high uh, speed of translocation. But for us, the more important thing was to see if there's any connection between those things. And when we uh, put it together, we see that there is a statistical uh, significant connection between the callos and the florin translocation. So with more callos, you are reducing the translocation speed in the florin. And we could even um, calculate that every callos deposit reduced the speed by 0 0.04 centimeter per hour and we can even model it with a regression model and also put in the CT values so the bacteria number and you we could see that uh, with more infectivity higher bacteria means that there's more callos that is deposited and it, it reduces uh, the translocation speed so here we have um a nice um, mechanism to suggest for this disease that the bacteria comes in, it causes callos to accumulate in the phloem, and this results in slower translocation speed in the phloem, and this will slowly, slowly uh, kill the plant because uh, everything uh, will not get the amount of energy and sugar that it needs to get. Second, my throat is dry. Okay. So then the next level that we looked at is the cell biology. And this is my favorite uh, thing. Um, and here we wanted to see, okay, so what is happening in the phloem? We want to understand a little about the interaction between the bacteria and the phloem. So unfortunately, we cannot label uh, the CLAS with any GFP, um, and we can't use the confocal, which is the easiest and uh, my favorite thing. Um, but um, with this bacteria, we had to use the TEM, which is much more uh, difficult, but it worked well. We can see uh, the bacteria, and we can label it with an antibody. Here, it's an antibody against the outer membrane protein of the bacteria. And you can see that the bacteria has different uh, uh, shapes, different structures. It can be uh, S means uh, spherical, so a round structure. It can be a uh, tubular, like, like a hot dog, or it can be what we call flex, which is uh, this half round, half elongated structure that we think it's this kind uh, intermediate structure. So it seems like this bacteria can change and can, can move between the different uh, morphologies. And another thing, just to um, show you how the phloem side looks under the electron microscope. So on the right side, you can see uh, the sieve plate, uh, CW, that's the cell wall. The PP can be two things. It's the phloem pore, but it's also the phloem proteins, you see this dark material inside the pore. And then the callos is here. So CA is the callos, and that's the callos that is deposited. And we always see some level of callos in the phloem pores. But you can really see, to get this kind of uh, image of how more callos will be blocking the transport between uh, one sieve element to the other sieve element. Um, 
So we were, uh, we wanted to look at the bacteria inside the phloem when we thought that the best way will be to look at uh, the sink tissues because uh, we assumed that the bacteria will go with the phloem flow. So we were testing different uh, sink uh, tissues and I'll just show you two that we looked at. One is the flush, the new leaves, and the other is uh, the seed coat, so in the fruit. So both are uh, sink tissues. And again, we wanted to see the bacteria inside the cells and also very interesting for us, it's how the bacteria move from one sieve element to the other one. So I'll start with the leaves, the young leaves. So here you have the, the TEM images and this, this is the plate here. You can see the callos and, and then you can see the open space that is available. In the healthy one, most of it is open. Then on the center, on the right one, it's both infected, uh, either non-symptomatic or symptomatic. With the non-symptomatic, you have an example here of one pore that's open and one pore that's closed. And on the symptomatic, it's an example for something that's completely plugged and there's nothing, uh, there's no pore, there's no opening left in this pore. There's huge accumulation of the callus. But of course, everything was, came, uh, there was a lot of diversity between things. But if we look, when we look at a lot of the pictures and we uh, calculate everything, so what we're calculating here on the right is the uh, pore opening. So what's the size of the open pore, the available uh, open uh, opening in the pore? So we can see that there's um, uh, the, the pores in the uh, infected tree, in the sick trees are more closed. There's always more callos that is closing the pores compared to the healthy ones. And when we look at the genes that are involved in uh, phloem plugging, so that's the, uh, the, cal, uh, the CAL-S, that's the callose synthase, that's the genes that are uh, producing callos, that are depositing callos. And the PP2 is the phloem protein that's also uh, uh, involved in uh, uh, pore plugging with the phloem protein. So, in general, all of them are upregulated, some more than the others, but there's a general upregulation of all these genes. So that uh, makes sense. But here was another surprise that we didn't see any bacteria inside these cells. So we see the plugging, we see the phloem getting plugged by, uh, uh, by the callos, but we don't see bacteria. And we were looking and looking and there was very, very little bacteria. This is, uh, in this table, you can see a two-year study that we did, and we looked at a lot of sieve elements, and the uh, percentage of sieve elements that contained bacteria, it ranged from zero to 13. And so let's say 10%, or maybe it's probably more because I don't think with the TEM we get everything, but for sure there's very little uh, bacteria, much less than we expected, and most of the sieve elements, they are getting plugged, but without having the bacteria inside. So then we went to the seed coats, and here we saw almost, you can say, the mirror image, the opposite image. So tons of bacteria in every section that we looked at. There was never a seed coat that wasn't full of bacteria. So it was always, always have tons of bacteria inside, but if you can see the pores, especially on the right pictures, you can see that there is just zero callos here. There's nothing. It's completely open. And this is at a level that you don't usually see. You never see plasmodesmata or phloem pore with zero callos, with no callos at all. So that was uh, interesting. And we were uh, asking, what's the reason? So it can be something about the seed coats, maybe the plant does not deposit callos in the seed coats because it wants to uh, uh, preserve the phloem running and the offsprings, or it can be something that the bacteria is doing. Maybe the bacteria is actually breaking the callos. So we compared it now to healthy seed coats, which is not an easy thing to do in Florida. Uh, good luck finding a healthy fruit. 
but we were lucky because there was another experiment that was running uh, where we work that uh, grew uh, trees under uh, protection, uh, protecting protected structures, so we can really build this experiment. So now when we look at the healthy seed coats, we see that there's always a certain level of callos, a certain level of normal plugging in the phloem. But when you have the bacteria inside, when you have it infected, then it's completely open. There's no callos at all. And we look again at a lot of pictures. We measure the pore opening. And we see this strange situation that uh, actually when the bacteria is present, there's no, there's no callos at all. Then we looked at the uh, gene regulation and again at the callosynthesis and the flowing proteins. And here everything goes down very dramatically. So all of those callosynthesis and also the PP2, they are going down when you have uh, the bacteria inside. So it's almost the opposite of what we thought is happening uh, with the bacteria. And one nice thing was uh, that with this high level of bacteria, we can see also the bacteria crossing uh, this, the flowing pores. And you can really see how there is this perfect fit between the bacteria and the pore. So you can understand why the bacteria has to break all the callos that will be in the pores. Otherwise, there is no way that the bacteria can move through. You can see sometimes it, it takes this little turn and really fit inside the pore uh, very nicely. But one thing you can see that also uh, was interesting, we were thinking about those helical structures that are definitely too big to move uh, through the flowing pores, but uh, we saw a lot of the situations when, when these guys came into the pore, they actually were able to change their structure and then fit right into the pore and fit inside and then move to the other side. So there's a lot of, uh, those bacteria are not passive at all and they bind to the pore and, and they are able to target the pore and also somehow move through. We can also, we also saw that there's a lot of binding to the membrane right next to the flowing pores. And we think that's part of the targeting of the bacteria to the pores to enable the movement. So speaking about destiny or something like this, you know, I, I did all this virus movement work with Sandy. I went to Florida, I changed to citrus, I changed to bacteria, but again, I'm dealing with opening the pores, targeting the plasma membrane and moving through from one cell to the other. So there's no escape. And again, I'm looking we're looking for a movement protein here that the bacteria is using to move from one cell to the other. So I'm just stuck in this topic. There's no way out. We also looked at the reactive oxy oxygen species and we saw the same thing in the leaves. There's a strong uh, um, induction of the reactive oxygen species, but remember there's not a lot of bacteria here. And this is the seed coats where we isolated the vasculature and we see that we see the opposite thing. There is a, a decrease in the um, accumulation of uh, the reactive oxygen species and also in the gene that is producing those uh, uh, reactive ROSs. Just to be sure that it's not something that's specific to the uh, seed code, that it's a general thing, we went back to the leaves, but now here, we divided the cells, the sieve elements, to those that have the bacteria, which were the very small part, and the cells that don't have the bacteria, that we don't see any bacteria inside. And when we look at those flowing pores in the ones that don't have the bacteria in the leaf, we see that there's a plugging. You can see this in the pictures uh, 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 in the bottom side of the, of the slide, but where you have the bacteria inside, when we see the bacteria inside, suddenly the pores are much more open. So it's the same thing that the bacteria is doing also in the leaves. But the major effect is the effect of the bottom part because most cells just don't have 
the bacteria inside. So now we are suggesting a different sort of scenario here where we have uh, the healthy cells and they will have, we can call it this physiological level of callos, physiological level of reactive oxygen species of salicylic acid. But then in the infected tree, we have two scenarios. We have the cells that don't have the bacteria inside. And in these cells, the plant is responding very strongly and accumulates the callos in the pores, accumulates the reactive oxygen species, uh, induces this, the salicylic acid. But in the cells that have the bacteria, actually there will be uh, attenuation of the defense response. The bacteria really inhibits the plant response. And so there's very low level of reactive oxygen species and the pores are open and the bacteria can move uh, cell to cell. And the last part will be the molecular part, which is very difficult with citrus. You know, it's, uh, it's not easy to do molecular work when we are trying to, let's say, transform a tree. It will take years until we can use it for anything. So the student which did it already left. The money is already gone. The project already changed. And we sometimes we have to think hard what we wanted to do with this when we planned it in the beginning. But still, we can do some molecular level. The big problem is the genetics. It's really, we are working with very little genetics. But what we did here, we wanted to understand, OK, so now we have a good system. We can learn a little about what's happening, the interaction between the bacteria and the phloem. So we developed this uh, method that we can take the seeds and we can dissect just the vasculature out. So this is the vasculature that's connected to the plant and then it feeds into the seed. And so this really uh, gives us a good system because the big limitations for this were always that there's not a lot of bacteria in the leaves and it's very hard to get clean uh, vasculature. And here we are sort of killing two birds at once and we get uh, only the vasculature with tons of psyllas inside. And we are doing now a lot of genomics and proteomics and protein interactions. And so we are in the stage where we, we have all these big lists that we need to understand what they mean. And, and, but we are really getting good stuff. We see a lot of phloem proteins going up, a lot of defense related protein, a lot of things that are related to callos. Uh, we see a lot of antimicrobial uh, peptides going up, so we have a lot to, to work with. But I'll just show you now one example. Um, so like I said, genetics, it's very difficult, but we are very lucky for three people uh, working with citrus because we do have one system that only takes a year or two, which is amazing. Um, and that's using the citrus tristeza virus. So you, you, you can do virus-induced gene silencing with the citrus tristeza virus. And the nice thing with this is that you can see here they silence the PDS. And when I say they, it's the Bill, uh, Bill Dawson lab that uh, worked in our center. Um, um, the, the really lucky thing is that also citrus tristeza virus is phloem localized. So for HLB research, it's really lucky situation that we can do some gene silencing and it's specifically in the phloem. So this is a good system. And I'm going to show one example, but unfortunately I'm not going, I can't say the name of the specific gene because we applied for a patent with this. So I have to keep it quiet, but it's something that I worked on before. If you will look at my list of publications, you, you won't have a lot of um, candidates to choose from. So it's one of them. And I call it callus regulator. So with this uh, citrus tristeza system, we were able to downregulate the expression of this gene. And we saw that it worked very nicely to really decrease the expression of callus synthase 7 and the PP2, and there was less callus. So what we wanted to do here is to reduce the plugging, to, to open the veins, let the sugar flow better. And with these plants, there was also, when we looked at the uh, developments of 
development of the disease symptoms. There was a delay in the onset of the symptoms. We only saw symptoms in about half of the trees and the symptoms level was uh, much lower. So they weren't very severe. But maybe the, the um, sort of like the interesting thing here is that what we're doing here, reducing the callosynthase and we're reducing the PT2 is just like what I showed you a few minutes ago that the bacteria is doing. So we are actually mimicking what the pathogen is doing here. So in a certain way, we are helping the bacteria or at least mimicking the bacteria action here, but this gives us less uh, symptoms in the tree. So it's a really cool situation. So this is the last slide where I'll try to put everything together. So what we are thinking now that we have the phloem, at one point the bacteria will enter the phloem, and then the phloem will uh, very quickly induce a defense response to block the bacteria, eventually probably kill the cell and get rid of the bacteria by inducing uh, the callos in the phloem pores and uh, uh, also inducing the reactive oxygen species. But unfortunately, this defense response, it's not effective at all because the bacteria comes with some mechanism uh, to uh, uh, break down the callos or inhibit the, uh, the, the position of callos and to downregulate the reactive oxygen species. So this defense response really does not, it's not able to block the bacteria. The bacteria has what it needs to, to counteract this defense. And not only is it not efficient, it's also turned on in a lot of sieve elements that don't have any bacteria at all. And maybe that's even the worst situation because here um, uh, in those cells, which are the majority of the cells, you are blocking the sugar transport. And then slowly, slowly, the tree just declines, 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 and eventually the tree dies. So it's this kind of situation that definitely not working for the tree. It's very inefficient uh, uh, for the tree side. And now what we are trying to, so this is sort of like where we are now in terms of describing the situation. And what we are trying to do now is use this um, model to think of ways that we can um, inhibit the disease progression. So we're thinking of two ways. One of them will be to uh, understand how the bacteria uh, inhibits this defense response, how the bacteria opens the and reduce the ROS. And if we will understand it and we will be able to somehow block it, then the uh, plant defense response will become much more efficient and then the plant can really crash and kill hopefully the bacteria. But there's also another way, like I showed you. Um, so another, so if we call this the, the aggressive way, the, the, the here we are, trying to kill the bacteria. We can also do something that's not, uh, it's more nice to the bacteria, non-confrontive way. And we can also try to just abolish or reduce the defense response of the plant, the plant response to the bacteria. And what we are seeing that maybe it won't be perfect. There's other things that probably going on, but we are able also to reduce the uh, disease symptoms if we will make the plant fight a little less and let the bacteria live. So that's it. That's what I have. So thanks everybody for listening. And these are the people from the lab that um, uh, some of them are involved in this work. And uh, we also had close collaborations with Bill Dawson. Now it's the El Muftar lab with uh, Christopher Vincent and Bashist. I didn't write everybody here. We're also working with Wen Boma, with Bob Turgeon here. And the funding first came from the uh, from UF Early Career Seed Grant and then later from the USDA. And thank you very much for listening. So Gillian asked me to MC the questions. What we'll do is take questions from the room first, and then we'll move to questions from Zoom. So 
folks in Zoom land, uh, go ahead and type your questions into the chat or um, or raise your hand and I will try and figure out how to find you. Let me escape here. So questions here. I want you to just hand them over. Yeah. Hi. I've enjoyed that a lot. Thanks. Uh, a couple of quick questions. First of all, you, you had some differences in your uh, cultivars of citrus and I assume they're all they're all clonal within a few, uh, any given variety is a clone identical okay so was there any difference that could be exploited in the in the genetics of the citrus variety yeah we don't know um that yet but we do see I didn't put it here and I was thinking if I should put or not but I wanted to make it simple we do see that there's some, we don't have any resistant varieties, but we do have tolerant varieties. Right. Right. And in the tolerant varieties, so tolerance, it means that the pathogen is still there, but we still get good yield. The, the, the symptoms are not showing so much. And we looked at uh, sugar bell, we looked at uh, Mexican lime, and also there's a, one example I mean, the most advanced thing is that they were able to express the NPR1. So that's a transgenic plant that also is tolerant. And in all the three of those, uh, we see less callows. We don't know the genetic details, but with all of those, there is less callows in the phloem. So we, it, it, we are now also looking at the translocation speed, but we didn't do it yet. But there must be something in those tolerance that they react less. And I think that's uh, um, that maybe it's even beyond these uh, phloem things. I think a lot of the times um, when the plant reacts too much, it's, it's actually not good. I mean, it's just it, like COVID. It seems like a classic example of tolerance rather than resistance. Yeah, it is tolerance. And, uh, exactly. I'm just curious if you have insight in if you could limit that host response, the callus, uh, you know, closing up of those pores. Uh, would that, in the absence of the uh, uh, bacterium, have a negative effect on the uh, yield physiology of oranges? Or? Yeah, so we always see some callows and and but usually um, uh, we are uh, usually callows accumulates to large amounts in response to some stress that's usually the case that's where you see the massive things but yeah it's not as simple as I, as I showed here for sure because without callows there won't be any development of sieve elements even because callus deposition is even part of the, 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 how the pores are made. So it is more complicated than this diagram for sure. Yeah, we, we will need to find the right, it's a matter of where and how. Yeah, it's not a yes or no black and white thing. Well, and the uh, all of those uh, bacteria in the fruit um, are they multiplying in the fruit, or do you think some of them are actually being transported, moving along the flow transport pathway and arriving fruit? And we think, oh, okay. So Bob was asking why why do we see so much bacteria in the fruit? Is it because the bacteria gets there and multiply, or because it keeps coming in? So I would say that mostly it's the second that they keep coming in because you know, the fruit of citrus, it's like almost a year of development. It's like eight months. It's a long, long time that the phloem just go in and in and in. So I don't think there's really, it's, it's really a model thing. I don't think it's important for the disease or anything, but it's just a consequence of the situation that it just keeps coming in for month and month and month. But we do see sometimes, but I, I cannot say that uh, it's proving anything, but we do see, if I'll go back, and we do see a lot of times that it looks like they're also dividing. We see those structures that looks like dividing bacteria, and we see that a lot. So uh, maybe a combination of both. Yeah, there's not so many bacteria in the roots, right? And that would also be an endpoint for transport. So. 
it's a little curious there that why you don't find a big buildup of bacteria in the roots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we looked at we looked at the roots, and it's like this kind of in between. There's more than the leaves, but it's not like um, it's not like this, those those fruits. I don't know, maybe the fruit is just a much stronger sink compared to the root. Yeah, I don't know. Just take one more from the room, Claire, and then we'll move to the Zoom questions. So, I have two parts. You talked about detection and difficulty of detection. So, can you leverage the seed coat or fruit? Or are they already doing that for improving detection? Yeah, we're trying to tell people if you want to do PCR, go for the seed coats. It's, the problem with seed coats is that you have to uh, dissect. If you just take the whole seed, it's very hard to do PCRs. There's a lot of dirty materials there. You have to um, um, first get rid. You have, there's an extra step that you have to do. So that's a little problematic, but we're trying, we're telling people, but the it's other, not very successful. The other question was, does, do these findings apply to any of the other Levirobacters? So the pathogenic or non-pathogenic? What, what, sorry? Do the findings with the callos, has anything similar been found with the other Libirobacter? Yeah, um, yeah. so Claire was asking if with other Libirobacter, we are also seeing the callos accumulation. So yeah, I think, I think so. I'm certain about other intracellular pathogens like the phytoplasma for sure. With other Liberibacter, I, I think so, but I can't say that I have a hundred percent, like, clear thing in my head if I saw that they were uh, looking at it. But the phytoplasma also caused this. Okay, I think we have time to do these two questions in the chat. I'll ask them together, and you can just uh, answer them together. Okay. From Madeline Dumas, what is limiting the use of young citrus plants for the study of sea loss host interactions in flush? Uh, and then Marina Mann asked, um, can you elaborate a bit more on how you distinguish CLAS using TM? How can you tell it's not some other uh, endophytic bacterium? Yeah. So for the first question, I mean, for the flush, we do use uh, younger trees. The, the problem became when we needed the fruits. So that you have to use older trees. But yeah, when we are doing uh, experiments, when all we want to do is look at the young leaves, we can grow them in the greenhouse and they're like this big and that's, that's enough for us. About the second question, um, so like what we're using is uh, this antibody against the outer membrane protein and we are labeling the bacteria, but like you saw, we don't do it in every experiment that we're doing because we are, it's just will be too complicated. We sort of, do a few examples, we're using the S antibody and then in the other experiment we didn't use it. So I will say that I can't be 100% sure, but we can be 100% sure that this is the bacteria that cause the citrus greening disease because we see it only when the, uh, when the, when the trees are infected. We never see any bacteria in the phloem in healthy trees. It could be a, a mixture. Maybe there's more than one specific bacteria. I, I don't, um, I mean, I can't rule that out. And, but for us, we just, uh, what we care about is that this is the bacteria that is associated with the disease, but maybe there is a mix there. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, uh, let's uh, please join me in thanking Amit again for a great talk. And, and thanks everyone for coming. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.